Father, as we open your word this morning, um, it's a mighty word, it's a, a deep and eternal, powerful word, and we ask, Lord, that we would have the, the capacity to receive it from you, that we would, that our hearts would be uh, enlarged to um, to receive this word, to, to love it, um, and to respond to it properly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... Um, we know Bishop Neal, and he did a little survey in his congregation a few years back, back when he was a priest in Jacksonville. And he asked his congregation, how do you think God feels about you? He wanted to know how his people, uh, what his people thought about that. Yeah, give, give me one word to describe how God feels about you. So I kind of want to uh, do that with you guys, not aloud, but uh, just to ask you, how would you answer that question today? One word to describe how God feels about you. When Bishop Neil did it, the most common word he got back was disappointed. Disappointed. Isn't that amazing? Um, and, uh, and I think that's pretty common. I expect that that would be a fairly common word among us too. Many of us feel that God must be disappointed with us. Uh, maybe it's because of our persistent sin. Uh, or because of all the opportunities that we feel like we've been given and that we've missed, or maybe that we've messed up, um, or because of just the feebleness of our love for God, uh, or how long it's taking us to grow the fruit of the Spirit. But for one reason or another, God must surely look at us with a sense of disappointment. Um, but today we're going to see that the Bible says we're wrong about that. It's not clear whether God the Father ever looks at us with disappointment, but if he does, then we can be sure from his word that that feeling is a long way down the list of feelings that God has toward us. A bunch of other much bigger and more important feelings come first. And that's what we see when we uh, study what Paul has to say about the gospel in Romans chapter 3. So today we finally get to the good news. You can open your Bibles to Romans 3. We're going to start at verse 21. There was a Cambridge scholar and professor called Dr. Leon Morris who wrote that Romans 3, verses 21 through 26, he said this, may be possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Um, and Cambridge academics are not given to hyperbole. So, so we have a real feast before us this morning. Uh, in Romans chapter 3. Paul, after his long explanation of why everyone on earth is guilty before God and subject to the righteous anger of God, Paul reveals this great turning point in the story. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. All right, so this is part of what Dr. Leo Morris called the greatest paragraph ever written. And I want to zoom in on just three words that Paul uses in this paragraph today. From verse 21, the word manifested. From verse 24, the word justified. And from verse 25, the word propitiation. Okay, we're going to come back to that word at the end. And these three words point to three distinct effects of Jesus's death on the cross. And they show us how God really feels about us now. So first, from verse 21, the word manifested. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Manifested means revealed, shown off, put on display. And the Greek word here is phanero'o which comes from the root phino, meaning to shine, right? So the star that the Magi followed to find the baby Jesus appeared and it began to shine. And that word phino gives us our word epiphany. We think about the season of epiphany when the wise men came. Um, <clears throat> it means a bright and dazzling revelation, something a bit like a firework display. So here in Romans 3, the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's phanero'o and it's in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means it's completed action that has ongoing effects. So in other words, the cross of Jesus is now the fullest and most perfect manifestation of the righteousness of God 
and we will never see a better one. And Paul is <clears throat> just so glad to have lived to have seen this day. He says, but now, but now, and the but now is this massive turning point in the story. It's a brand new idea. It's a solution to the problem that nobody ever thought of. Nobody who lived before Jesus dreamed or imagined this, that God himself would take on flesh and solve the unrighteousness problem in the breaking of his own righteous body. The law caught just a glimpse of what was coming. The law pointed to it, but the law didn't get it. And the prophets didn't get it either. This is really brand new, says Paul. Many Jewish sages wrote many wise things, but not one of them guessed that this was how God was going to save the world. It was beyond their wildest dreams. But now Paul says it's real. Now it's here. Now it is put on bright public display. And now anyone with eyes to see can look at the cross of Jesus and say, God is righteous. God has a plan and God loves me. Friends, God would not have sent his son to die on a cross if his main feeling toward us was disappointment. No, his heart is manifested at the cross and God loves us. The foremost quality of his righteousness is love. And the cross demonstrates God's righteousness to us. And the cross also delivers God's righteousness to us. Do you see that? So in verse 21, Paul says, the righteousness of God has been manifested. And then in verse 22, the righteousness of God also comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe, right? So it's both demonstrated and distributed at the cross, delivered to us. So that takes us on to our second great word, which is justification. Now, we've said a few times already that when it comes to these ideas of righteousness and justice, we have two words in English, but the Greek Bible only has one. It's the same word. So to be just is to be righteous, to be unjust is to be unrighteous, and to be justified is to be made righteous. There's no difference at all in the Greek language. So Paul says in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So here is Paul's solution to the big global problem. Well, it's really God's solution, as Paul explains it. We've spent three weeks talking about the problem, right? And the problem is universal unrighteousness. That is the big problem throughout the world. And now here is Paul's solution. It is justification that we are made righteous again. So let's tease out exactly what Paul means by justification, because he means more than just forgiveness, but he means less than perfection, right? So justification is in between those two ideas. So Paul is using legal language here. It's the language of the law courts, how we stand before the righteous judge. And justification is saying more than forgiveness, because forgiveness means you did the crime, you're actually guilty, but we're not gonna make you pay for it. We're gonna let you off the punishment. But justification means you actually didn't do the crime. The court decides that you have nothing to pay because you're actually innocent. All right, so there was a scholar called Sir Marcus Lone, and he put this beautifully when he said, the voice that spells forgiveness will say, you may go. You have been let off the penalty which your sin deserves. But the verdict, which means acceptance, will say, you may come. You are welcome to all my love and presence. All right, so that's the first side, that justification means more than forgiveness. But on the other hand, it means less than perfection. So justification doesn't mean we are perfect. It means that God calls us perfect. The judge says that we didn't do it. The reason God says we didn't do it is the mechanism of substitution. We didn't do it because Jesus did. Jesus was executed as a sinner on account of our sin. And now we are treated as saints on account of his righteousness. 
You see, so the righteousness of God has come to us as a gift. In theological language, we have imputed righteousness. The very righteousness of God given as a free gift of his grace through the sacrifice of Jesus. But we're still not perfect in ourselves, are we? And there's still another mechanism that God has provided to achieve that. The New Testament calls it sanctification, and it's accomplished over time by the work of the Holy Spirit living within us. But that's a subject for another day. <laughs> for today, I want to magnify in our minds what Jesus has done for us on the cross, because it's more than just forgiveness, although it does include forgiveness. It's also a status of innocence of righteousness in God's sight, as if we never did the crime at all. So the Sunday school gimmick is helpful in remembering this. To be justified makes it justified never sinned, right? So if that's true, then when God looks at you, what reason would he have to be disappointed? Have you fully realized how completely all your sins, failures and shortcomings are removed from you? at the cross of Jesus and how richly clothed you are now in the righteousness of God. It means that when God looks at you, he sees a righteous person and he is pleased with you. He looks at you as he looked at Jesus at his baptism and says, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. All right, so we've got two of God's feelings towards us, which are much, much higher than disappointment. First, love, and second, pleasure. That's the second word, justification. But just before we go on to the third word, I do want to give a mention here to how God's righteousness is given and received, because Paul describes it here very clearly. It's very, very important. And the only reason I'm not giving it as much attention today is because I expect you already know this part really well. The church has generally done a good job teaching this. But to summarize, how is the salvation of God given? Paul's answer in verse 24 is by God's grace as a gift. In other words, it's not earned by any good works or deserved in any way, but comes only by the gracious gift of God. Second, how is it received? And Paul's answer in verse 22 is through faith. He repeats that again in verse 25. It is to be received by faith. In other words, it is available to everyone in the world but it does not automatically reach everyone. It only reaches those who believe in what Jesus did on their behalf and receive the gift through faith. And lastly, what is the means of salvation? And Paul's answer in verse 24 is it comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means to pay money, to buy back a slave. And the idea is that we were slaves, slaves to sin, completely incapable of escaping in our own strength. And Jesus' death on the cross paid the ransom price to redeem us from slavery, to buy us back out of it. So putting those three together, in Paul's words, we are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus to be received by faith. All right, so in all of this, we heartily, most heartily agree with the Protestant reformers, especially Martin Luther, when they taught the five solas. You may have heard of these, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, and sola deo gloria, the five pillars of the Protestant Reformation. In English, it means that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone on the authority of scripture alone, so that God alone gets the glory. This is our gospel. It's wonderful, it's sufficient, it's inclusive, and it's glorious. But we're not quite done yet because there's still another great word in this awesome paragraph, and it's the word propitiation in verse 25. So Paul finishes the paragraph, Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So I already explained to the children what a propitiation is. Uh, it's a gift that takes away anger and restores a relationship. And Paul says here that Jesus' own blood 
was that kind of gift to God the Father. So we remember when we were reading back in chapters one and two that there are really two great problems that are caused by our universal unrighteousness. The first is that God, as the judge of the world, who always does what is right, must punish our rebellion, right? So there's a legal problem. But the second problem is that God is also our creator and father, and he's personally offended and angry that we have turned away from him in favor of worthless idols. So on top of the legal problem, there's also a personal relational problem, as if we have offended the judge himself. So to satisfy the judge and acquit the crime is one thing, but what about satisfying the father? Paul says that Jesus does that too. His blood is not only a manifestation of the righteous love of God and also a payment for, to God for our forgiveness and also an imputation of righteousness for our justification. But on top of all these things, it is also at the same time a propitiation, a gift that satisfies the father, gives back what was taken and turns away his anger. Right. So the cross just layers on benefits. I'm going to use this like really trivial example, but like in my uh, bathroom cabinet, I go every night and I pull out my bottle of Listerine mouthwash. Right. And Listerine mouthwash just promises miracles on the on the label. It says not only is it going to fight plaque and gingivitis, it's also going to remove any stubborn food particles. It's going to cure my canker sores. It's going to improve my gums. And on top of all this, it's going to leave me with fresh breath. Like, how can you even do all that with one chemical? And uh, Jesus's cross is a bit like that in that it just layers on benefit after benefit. And it just thoroughly solves the problem of sin. And I do think, as I said to the children, that because of the propitiatory effect of the cross, it's true to say that God is never angry with his children anymore. He is not mad at us anymore. So if that's one of the feelings you were thinking of at the beginning, um, that has been taken away by Jesus at the cross too. So now that glorious promise that Scott read from Isaiah chapter 12 has come to pass. What Isaiah called that day, Paul calls this day, and it is our day too. Isaiah wrote, I will praise you, O Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. It's such a beautiful song. I was just reading it, listening to it again as Scott read it, thinking this is just so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful parts of the Old Testament. And Isaiah like wrote that hundreds of years before Jesus, not understanding what he was writing, right? The New Testament says he searched vainly for how the spirit of God was prompting him to write these beautiful words, how all this happened. And Paul says, now we know, now we see, now we see the whole plan. Every word of that prophecy is true in Jesus who has become our salvation. In the present time, God has made the whole plan clear. He has now solved the eternal riddle of how God can justify the sinners he loves and still be a just God. And what a mighty privilege it is to live, to see the solution to that great mystery. We have seen the glory of God manifested on earth, not in the parting of the Red Sea, nor a smoking mountain, nor in fire from heaven, or an angel choir, but in something that vastly outshines them all son of god nailed to a cross his blood the declaration of god's love for the world the payment for all the world's sin the gift that restored to god everything that was lost through sin and turned away the father's anger and so the problem of our unrighteousness is well and truly dealt with thoroughly resolved finished and we can come to God now with full and total confidence, not in ourselves or our own works or our own standing. Nobody can boast, Paul says, but we can come with complete confidence in our mighty Savior. We ask, was Jesus' death enough for me? And we answer, of course it was. Of course it was. When you stand in the presence of this glory, you cannot see anything else for brightness. And friends, nothing else like this, nothing as grand or magnificent 
magnificent or ever been conceived in the mind of man. Not in any religion or any philosophy or any science or any legend or any song. Against this, all the other religions of the world that claim to teach truth, they just appear like filthy rags. They have nothing compared to this. To choose any one of them over this, you would have to be blind. How can any of the others hope to solve the massive problem of sin? As I see it, none of the rest of the world's religions take the problem of sin nearly seriously enough. Because we have cancer and all they propose is a band-aid and a Flintstone vitamin. None of them include any kind of propitiation to the Father. Perhaps within them is some kind of attempt to pay for our own sin through some pathetic combination of prayer and good works. But it's dismal, really. It's hopeless. How could we expect to woo the eternal God with that miserable bunch of weeds? But not only is the attempt to pay for sin pathetic, there's not even any attempt to propitiate the legitimate anger that God feels at our very serious offense. So not only do they spurn the holy gift of the Son of God given on our behalf and ignore him and mock him and belittle him, they also offer nothing in his place. They have no other plan, which is quite frankly insulting to God and offensive. And if we should begin to imagine in our deluded hearts that any kind of Christless religion could be in any way acceptable to the Heavenly Father, then we are in for the shock of our lives on Judgment Day. Jesus outshines Buddha and Muhammad and the rest as the sun outshines a glowworm. And we sing with the choir of heavenly angels, all glory be to Christ, all of it. Friends, we've got to see how magnificent and worshipful our Saviour is and realise that we insult Jesus if we do not recognise him as the brightest and best and most glorious and most worshipful thing that we have ever seen. If we share our worship of him with anything else, we insult Jesus. If we hold back our hearts when he has so graciously given us his heart, we insult Jesus. If we hold ourselves unforgivable or unacceptable to God, we insult Jesus as if his death on the cross were in some way deficient or inadequate to pay for us. You think that you can out -sin this gift? And if we leave our friends in darkness, not knowing the extent of the gift that was given on their behalf and imagining in our delusion that what they have chosen instead might work out well for them in the end, then we insult our Savior. So we saw in chapters one and two that the bad news of Romans is so dignifying that it really becomes good news. And now here the good news is such an enormous weight of glory that we might be unsure whether to dance or to weep. But let us at least be sure of this, that our God is not disappointed in us, that instead he for sure loves us. He for sure accepts us forgives us, heals us, and smiles on us. And he has shown us that he wants to fold us into this great story that is far greater than anyone could dream or imagine.